Here we go. Today is Sunday, March 22nd, 2020, and this is episode 248 of the Defensive Security Podcast. My name is Jerry, and joining me tonight, as always, is Mr. Andrew Kellett. Good evening, Jerry. We find ourselves in odd times, my friend. Oh my goodness, do we ever. I mean, I'm glad we're still doing a show, but I don't know how many people care about this right now. (laughs) I, I assume... There are people who just need a distraction, right? I mean, like okay. like the people in solitary confinement. Yeah, yeah. For example, there's probably going to be some riots that need to be dispersed. Fair, fair. Pro- probably there's at least a couple folks at the CIA black sites who still need to be tortured, I imagine. Co- correct, yep, yep. I mean, those so those always, listen. yeah, they always have to be ready for that. So, yeah. I mean, there's, right, there's always an audience, Absolutely. It's true. It's true. Which is why we get the weird, you know, sort of ad offers for things like, you know, stun guns. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Rubber and, hoses and, and... Yeah. Right. Cattle prods. And, yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's, it's you know, the, the, the algorithms have gone wackadoo. So, but... Uh, so e- e- eclectic advertising is mm-hmm. the way I like to think of it. But obviously, I'm talking about the elephant in the room, which is... COVID-19, which has affected everybody on the planet, and it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's really interesting times for our profession because there's a, you know, it, inevitably there's a pretty significant overlap between security or in, uh, IT security and d- disaster recovery and business continuity. And sure. So, so, you know, we're, I, I think we're in, in many respects in, um, you know, kind of uncharted territory. Uh, you know, lo- most companies have a business continuity plan, you know, but most companies' business continuity plans don't really account for what's actually happening right now, where effectively the entire world is on, you know, lockdown simultaneously. So Yeah, and I'm going to say two things right up front. One, of course, our standard disclaimer Nothing we say reflects the opinions and views of our employers in any way, shape, or form, past, present, and future. Just get that disclaimer out of the way. Two, I have zero expertise in viruses and pandemics. And so, so nothing I say about the actual health or biology or medical aspect of this has any value to you whatsoever. Let's just put that out there. Don't listen to me on any of that. Go find an expert. But I do know a little bit about IT security and business continuity. And you're right. Most business continuity plans took into, about, took into account regional issues. Uh, and I don't know that they've ever taken into account things like this. So, you know, I think the most obvious issue that most companies are facing is having enough capacity, if they have the type of workspace, workforce that can go home and work from home, having enough capacity whether it be just as basic as having laptops or whether they can send desktops home and having VPN connectivity and, you know, all that sort of stuff, just the basics uh, to ramp up to, to do this. So, you know, my heart goes out to all those folks who are burning the mineral oil, just trying to get all that infrastructure up and running so that uh, majority of people can keep working. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, <laughs> if, you, if you go read Reddit, you know, that, the the sysadmin and, and IT subreddits are just uh, alight with war stories about that sort of thing. Yeah, it's it's not easy right now. I mean, on top of everything else going on, I mean, a lot of people are worried and rightly so about their family and their health. And uh, you know, I'm not an economist anyway, but I've never even heard of a situation where we have shut down so many jobs. I, I have no idea what the long-term inco- impact is going to be on the economy. Uh, you know, and one thing that's also kind of interesting but could be taken very badly is we we are 
in the profession of, of managing risk and understanding and measuring risk. And we look at it fairly dispassionately. You know, we don't think of it as lives and people and, you know, uh, but it's interesting looking at how certain segments of society or certain parts of society risk has been normalized and accepted, um, like the flu or like car crashes or suicides or, or all these other devastating things that cause, you know, many, many thousands of deaths per year, uh, but not this one. And I am certainly in no position to judge that, but I find it fascinating why we have sort of, and when and ever, if we will accept this sort of potential death rate as, in essence, normal and an acceptable risk for society to continue. Because I don't think we'll, we'll be able to sustain a lockdown in, inevitably. And of course, you know, again, I go back to my earlier statement, I don't know jack about viruses, but I, you know, and I'm trying to be not insensitive to the risks and the deaths and the terrible consequences of this. At the same time, I think about we in our profession manage risk, or at least try to manage risk and make risk decisions every day. And society does it too, whether they know it or not. And we do risky things because we think it's worth it. Uh, and suffer a certain amount of death as a consequence. And this is the first time I've seen us ever say, no, we will not continue society and allow this to happen as a normal course of, of action. So, uh, you know, when you really abstract away from it, I don't know what all the lessons are, but it's fascinating from a risk manager standpoint, if that makes any sense, what my rambling is saying. No, it, it, it does. And I, I will say, I think, um, I think you're right. I I remember, I remember the, the the first SARS, the swine flu, the bird flu, and you know those those all looked like they were going to be MERS. I guess was another one. They they all looked like they were they had the potential to you know to be really significant pandemics. And I think um, at least one of them was it swine flu. I, I forget. They all blend together right now, but it was actually declared a pandemic and. You know, we, our reaction wasn't anything like this. But at the same time, you know, there's been lots of people who talk about the number of, uh, you know, the, the number of people who have died from, uh, from the COVID nineteen as compared to the, you know, the seasonal flu, and say that it's, you know, it, it, we're still way below that. But at the same time, I think it's the, it's the unknown factor, right? We know, in general, how many people are going to die of the seasonal flu every year. And it, it always falls within a certain, you know, a certain percentage of, of that rate. And we know the same thing with suicides, car crashes, diabetes, deaths, obesity, heart attacks, and so on and so on. And, you know, many of those things are on the upward trend, un unfortunately, but they're not, you know, they're like, the, we're not going to have an epidemic of car crashes suddenly that's going to kill, you know, 10 or a hundred times more people than normal. And I think that's what's differentiating this particular um, thing, again, you know, this particular pandemic, you know, as compared to other uh, other risks, in, in my view. And I think this is the act, that the reaction is a precautionary one. It, it, it It's really, it is un, un, unprecedented and it's really taxing uh, our, our re recovery plans in ways that, I don't think many of us ever had anticipated. So you're, I completely agree. It's fascinating to watch in a in kind of a morbid sort of way. Yeah, I mean, we're still very early in this, and I may change my opinion, right, as we're more directly affected by it and people we know, right. you know get sick and potentially die. And then it becomes a lot less interesting and a lot more tragic mm -hmm. when, when it touches you personally. But exactly. I feel like we're living through – a major historical event, you know, on par with ones even more, more historic than, you know, nine 11 probably was for, for people of our age. Uh, you know, we'll see what the lasting consequences are. Certainly nine 11 has had very lasting consequences, but I don't know. It's, um, yeah, this is, this is like a Spanish flu slash 
uh, you know, Great Depression kind of thing. It it, it seems like. I mean, we'll see, again. You you only know that in after it's happened, but um, you know, we'll see. Well, you know, the other thing that's really devastating a lot of folks is, you know, a lot of people are getting put out of work right now, and yeah, uh, yeah. and not many people are hiring. I know a few are, but all the hiring has pretty much come to to a halt. So. You know, I hope your own personal disaster recovery plan is in place for situations like this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and it is. I mean, it's look at frankly, it sucks, and it sucks for a lot of people. I know there's untold people who are just just completely devastated financially, and and I mean, it, not even to mention the people who have loved ones and 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 whatnot that are. Um, you know, being affected directly by, by this. Um, ha- having said that, you know, this is an opportunity. If, um, I mean, f- for what it's worth, you always need to try to look for the opportunity if you can to to upskill. I mean, I think we interestingly we live in a you know in a time in human history where you can pretty much learn anything that you would want you could want to learn for either free or you know very inexpensively now it doesn't give you the experience but you know the the reality is things are dark right now and they're probably going to get darker but we will it, you know things will turn around and um you know you you want to be you know, hopefully positioned to personally come out of it okay so don't lose hope use the you know yeah. use the opportunity to to your advantage, I guess is what I'll say. You know, one last thing I'll say on that, and I know you, we didn't plan on talking about this, and I kind of drove us down this path because, you know, I'm mean. Uh, I'm not a financial planner. I'm not a financial analyst. I have no degrees or certifications or accreditation whatsoever. So take that first. Second, I think that this is a once-in-a-generation potential wealth building opportunity if if you can come out of this hole and and you know obviously you don't have serious illness and don't lose a lot of family members and and have some cash available the market is going to be so depressed much like the great depression that just jumping into index funds is going to make you a lot of money i think Mm -hmm. or other opportunities because every the, the, the panic of the market is short term. So either we go to complete societal collapse, in which case it doesn't matter about the market, or we get back to some semblance of normalcy and that market will recover and continue to climb as it has since the market came into being. So if you can, you know, I don't suggest timing the market. I have no idea where the bottom is, but I know that eventually we will get back to where we were and exceed it. And if you've got a 20 year time horizon, you're looking at a hell of a sale in the stock market right now. Yeah. My uh, two cents for what no, it's worth. It, 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 it is. Um, I mean, it's hard to think in those terms when everything's looking apocalyptic, but um, we, we do have to continue to think long term to the extent we can. I mean, I obviously that's hard to do if you don't have food in your pantry and toilet paper in your bathroom. But um, of course, yeah, you know, yeah, you got to, you got to, get, you know, this is only if you've got extra cash and you know, right, uh, everything else is fine. Uh, and and that may seem like a one percent sort of situation, right? Only one percent would be there. But I I just personally see this as. For the folks who were came out of the Great Depression and were in a good enough position, they made, you know, generation changing wealth by being able to be in the market when that came roaring back. So Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is in in addition to that, there's another opportunity in you in, know investing in your in yourself and in, in in learning something new that would be valuable uh in useful when it's when things do start to recover. So, sure. it, you know, it, look, I mean, it, things will start to recover and, and I don't know if that's 
next month and six months and eight months and a year or two. I, I, don't re- I don't really know when. I hope it's sooner rather than later for everybody's sake. But it, it will it will start to recover and you know it would behoove us all to make sure we have marketable skills and and um, you know can find something that you know, not only puts you know food on the table but also is somewhat um, satisfying to do so so there you go yeah that's um, fair enough you know that's that's uh, the philosophy of Jerry and Andy in, in fifteen <laughs> minutes. And, you know, uh, just to be clear, I have all the sympathy in the world for people who are fighting this. Obviously, I went through a serious, scary health battle myself last year. And, you know, I don't take this stuff lightly. Um, And so please don't perceive anything I said as a lack of concern. It's more, you know, beyond that, what can we do to to take care of ourselves long term? And by the way, I think... to to us to some extent, I mean, we're all we're all impacted by this. It's one of the interesting things is it is um, you know it's it's not uh, it's not discriminating much in terms of who it's impacting. So, but I I I think this is quite. Ca- I know f- you know for me and in my family, it, this is causing a lot of anxiety, right? And I suspect that that's not a a unique thing. That's really where I was driving to. I don't think it's this kind of anxiety doesn't know, you know, uh, demographic limitations, I guess is the way I'd, the way I'd say it. And, and, you know, you can either sit and worry yourself to death or, you know, focus on, on doing something right. And that could be helping others, helping yourself, you know, but, but look, look for, uh, you know, look for something brighter. So, Anyway, that's my happy inspiration for the the day. So, fair enough. All right, so let's do a let's do a couple of stories. I think these were these are a little timely. Um, I picked them because I I thought they are, uh, are are probably things that many companies and and IT people are are wrestling with right now. The first story comes from Biz, Business Insider, and the title is "Apple's Culture of Secrecy is Making It Hard for Employees to Work Remotely During the." Co- coronavirus outbreak report says why are you picking on apple well you know so so it's interesting that the you know kind of the summary of this is that apple has a lot of intellectual property protections in place to help guard against unauthorized leaks but those same protections are now preventing them or at least you know according to these reports making it harder for employees to actually do productive work outside of the office and I do have to wonder, you know, if you are the security, like the lead, the CISO or whatever of uh, whatever the equivalent position in, in in Apple is, like, are you proud of this story or are you disturbed <laughs> by this story? You know that. Is, well, I mean, it gets to the crux of the, of the fundamental challenge we have in this business, which is enough security to protect to the level of risk acceptance of the organization without inhibiting work too much, right? Without adding too much friction such such that people can't get things done or that the impact of that friction is beyond the company's willingness to accept. Apple has been on the far side of that pendulum swing of being very, very secure and thus adds a great deal of friction to working from home. And that's a choice they as an organization made. And it might be the right choice the majority of the time for them. Mm -hmm. But now you see, hey, when when suddenly we've got to work from home, you can't just unwind these protections. I I don't know what they are. I don't know the details of them, but I've seen similar companies elsewhere. And I, I can make some assumptions that these are not things you just turn off, right? You have to be very thoughtful in how you allow this remote access, if at all, uh, while still maintaining the level of security one. Or you just, you know, have to put projects on hold. Well, it, I mean, ultimately, that is that is the trade-off, right? You you either have to be okay with people in in this particular environment, right? Which I think is an exceptional case. It's not really happened in this you know in this way where 
like no none of your employees anywhere in the world can go to the office uh, to to do work. You know, I I I think that's a pretty unusual situation. Um, but this is that is the exact issue here, and I think that if you read between the lines, it it's pretty clear that they're not allowing Apple employees to work with source code or or pre-release products from home. And and so now you know that has a pretty uh, you know pretty apparent effect that it, it, it's difficult for Apple to you know, release new you know new versions of their operating systems and whatnot if they don't have if they can have people working from home. I suspect this is a tractable problem. They can probably they could I, I'm certain they could engineer some way to work with source code you know through a lab which which would you know all but eliminate i mean you, you you can never stop people from using their cell phone to take pictures of their you know their their laptop screen but you know short of that there's lots of things that you you can do the the one challenge i see is that and this is probably going to be true for you know the next story too is these things are, are it would have been much better for these things to already be in place than than uh, than trying to put it in now because it's really difficult to do it's you know, buying new equipment is pretty tough right now. I guess I, I agree with that statement, but at the same time, is it reasonable? And this is something we were talking about earlier. Most business continuity plans don't account for this sort of situation. And then let's say they did. Is the cost worth it for a yeah. one percentile chance of happening? Well, true, true, and so just because just because you can do something doesn't mean you need to, and so th- this is where business decisions need to come in place, right? I mean, somebody at Apple surely could say, "Well, you know what? Understand, but it's it's more important for us to continue releasing new products, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna relax." the you know those restrictions a little bit or they're going to come to the you know the alternate conclusion and say you know what those the 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 basis upon which we made those prior decision control decisions are still valid and you know we're willing to not we're we're willing to slip product releases or or some third mix of the two yeah right? they yeah. design some new methodology whatever sure spend money to uh yeah yeah, but you know, I'm 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 speaking a little more broadly too. Like, let's say, you know, your VPN farm. Do you waste? I shouldn't say waste. Do you spend the money to have every possible employee work from home? When on average, you have twenty percentile of your workforce working from home, and that other eighty percentile is usually in the office, or it's a rotating twenty percent, or whatever the the facts are. You could say, hey, there's a worst case scenario. We need everybody to work from home, but is that a wise use of money? Certainly right now, it sure seems like it in hindsight. Right. But I go back to the likelihood of this event occurring. So it's it's sort of like I bet good money, a good chunk of companies, business company plans now going to take into account this situation. However, much like everything, much like many other things in InfoSec, we're often fighting the last war. What if this scenario doesn't happen again for another 70 years? Yeah. And it might not. I mean, hopefully it doesn't. So then is that a wise spend? I don't know. I Maybe, maybe not. Probably not. Of course, you can't predict these things. Well, you know, the other thing we can't predict is what we go back to, right? I mean, w- once we get on True. the other side of this, do we, you know, do we actually go back to the way, on average, do we go back to the way we were before or does it change? Do you have, do you end up with more people permanently working from home or, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. It does seem like this is one of the. I, I get your point completely. That the point is, you know, you buy, you, you have to buy some capacity to handle the short term lump in the snake, as they say, um, which you're not going to need in hopefully a month or two. When I mean, I, I hope it's that fast, but who really knows? When when uh, you know when everybody's quote back to work and back to normal, uh, and then you no longer need that capacity. Uh, this is, I, I guess, is you know, you have two options. One is you can use this as an opportunity. Well, more than two options, but you know, you can use this as an opportunity to upgrade capacity and like replace 
you know, move to something that that's uh, you know newer and and high, higher capacity, knowing that you're going to have excess capacity when you're done, or you can look for I, I mean, I know that there are cloud services where you can, you know, you can kind of buy it by the drink almost, and you can. Yeah, I was just thinking that too. You know, a lot of the cloud services are very able to be elastically, you know, built up as needed. Right. Right. And so, so, you know, that's, the, the, that's another, that's another option where you could say, well, we're going to, you know, we're not going to replace our, our Cisco ASAs or, or, you know, augment them that we're going to go to Palo Alto and buy a, and by the way, I have no affiliation with Palo Alto at all. Um, you know, we're going to go to, to name your network, uh, you know, your, your, your SAS VPN provider and, buy services, you know, buy services from them based on the capacity that we need today. And then when things return to normal, we'll turn it back down so that, you know, there's, there's options. It really comes down to, you know, the, the issue is that's going to be more expensive, right? I mean, the Cisco ASA is going to on paper look like it costs less money, but that doesn't factor in all the, you know, all the other overhead costs. You got people that manage that thing and power and the spot in your data center and on and on and on. So, um, you know, it's, it, it, it really is going to come down to what does your organization value and, and what, you know, what kind of, you know, what kind of decisions are they going to make? Yep. So, um, but you know, it's, it's interesting that companies like Apple is one of, uh, you know, I think one of two companies that's got over, I think it still has over a trillion dollar market cap, which is you know, a company that size having that problem is uh, kind of interesting. All right. So our next story comes from CSO online and the title is eight key security considerations for protecting remote workers. Now this sounds like somebody trying to sell us something. Well, that could be, I mean, at the end of the day, most people are right. Uh, so kind of like we were talking about in the last story, one of the issues I see with a lot of this is um, it it would have been better to you know to have all this stuff in place before uh, you know before the pandemic uh, broke out, and and so that's well, just uh, just an observation, course, I guess. Right. I mean, it's, um, it's always better to be prepared and invoke your plan than try to scramble during the event. Yeah. But, now there is another thing about this this article that makes that uh, temporarily made me start breathing into a paper bag. And uh, and that is, you know, the idea of allowing home or your employees to connect their home computers to your company network. So the well, I, I thought about that too. But look at it this way: what if you've got no other option? What if you have no laptops to give out? They can't take their desktops home. I'm just telling you that it caused me to breathe into a paper bag. That's I'm not I, saying. I I'm I'm not I, saying. <laughs> that it's, it's a not terrible right. idea, but. <laughs> When you're in the land of bad ideas. Right. You may as well go all the way. Well, no, no. Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> if my mission to you were, okay, tell you what, I got 50 home employees is going to use their home computers to connect to our corporate environment, make it go and make it secure. You got to find a way. No, you, you're, you're right. You're right. So in that, in that spirit, the first, uh, you know, first recommendation here is determine what endpoint protection you will require for home users and they do point out I, that um oh well, go ahead I personally make them wear a full body condom whenever they're on the vpn well I, I, that seems prudent i guess oh that's not the kind of pro- my, my no. misread protection yeah but my well, notes are all wrong for this one now i've got to uh, wait so we're not talking no 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 it's the wrong podcast you're <laughs> you're thinking of the other podcast all right uh yeah so um they they point out here that Windows Defender is is quite good for Windows 10, which is what most people are, are probably using at home, except for those who are Macs. And then it's primarily X Protect and Fairy Dust, which I guess is what protects uh, Macs. And and Why? So Mac, that, Macs can't get viruses. Well, that's true. That is true. If Macs could get viruses, did then or malware, this would be a, a more concerning problem. Fair. Uh, but since they so, can't, then it's uh, it's all good, yeah. I, I mean, let's take it to the next step, though, on, in all honesty, in all seriousness. 
a lot of people may be able to do their jobs off of tablets and iPads and yes. similar, you know, depending on what sort of interface of whatever it is their job is. Uh, and I don't think they really talk about that too much in here, but that's another consideration. No, they don't. And, you know, they, they do talk later in here about using things like virtual desktops and, and whatnot, which, you know, like an iPad would be would be pretty good because it's, I mean, while it's not entirely foolproof, they're probably a lot less likely to be totally compromised than your average home computer. So, uh so yeah, they you know they they mention here, kind of thinking through the endpoint protection strategy, and per, and then also they they go into talk about well you know how are you going to support these home computers, which all, again made me start breathing into a paper bag, and they recommended things like Splash Top or or Log Me In Rescue, which are just fabulous fabulous products. Um. So, so number well, I, I, I'm starting to guess that this article might have been targeted at maybe the SMB business space, not so much the large enterprise space. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. Um, but I, I guess uh, you know after, after the the eighth time you've you've seen uh, computers compromised through log me, and you're you're like, eh, maybe maybe that's not the best thing ever. Uh, is it really a compromise when it in its own name says log me in? I mean, that's a service. I mean, is that a compromise? Touche. Touche. I mean, it's working as design ticket closed, right? That's a feature. <laughs> All right. So the next uh, recommendation is to review what software remote employees need. Terrible grammar there, but uh, we'll let it slide in this new world of uh, coronavirus. Uh, you know, they they point out here that you know, your your employees may need things like uh, you know office access to Office three sixty five and uh, you know your if you're again if your home employees are using their home computers they may not have a properly licensed version of Microsoft Office and so you need to you need to be in a position to provision that and there's you know, different ways that you can do that. Uh, they in, go on to point out that right now Microsoft is, and, I, and by the way, I think many companies are really um, becoming quite flexible with their licensing terms right now. Uh, Microsoft, for instance, is, as they point out here, is uh, offering six months of Teams, Microsoft Teams, and and then uh, they do point out that Windows Virtual Desktop on Azure is another uh, option for you know, allowing people to use Office 365 without um you know without some of the hassles of having to support um you know home computers so good um uh, i mean it's a, that's a fairly decent suggestion the the le- the more kind of commonality you can drive i think the better you know the the better off you are from a support perspective uh, otherwise it's you know like somebody's um you know Core, you know, i seven core, uh, you know, two thousand series with uh, four gigs of RAM and trying to run Windows, Windows ten, and you know, you're going to end up in in a world of pain. I do like the idea of driving everybody to a Citrix farm or a virtual desktop farm that they do their actual work on, because then I only care about the random home PC being able to connect to that device in some way. Exactly. And everything else I can I can handle there. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Uh, number three, re- ensure remote access does not introduce more risk. But, uh, but uh, uh, uh. okay, go ahead, Mister Callet. Is there something you like to say? That's like saying make the enterprise secure. Yeah. Right. Or the firewall is dead. Um. Mm. Of, of course, it's going to introduce risk. Uh, well, a- so I mean, I think we, w- when you read the details, the, what they're really trying to point out is maybe it's not a great idea, as we've talked about in the past, to open up RDP to the internet as as people are wont to do sometimes. So maybe a better way to say this is be smart about how you're enabling remote access. I think that would be a much better way to to say this. Yes, absolutely. 
Um, you know, and they, they also point out that some of the services, by the way, that you may you may want to try to drive people to use could actually be blocked by certain ISPs. And they, they point out that um, Comcast, for instance, blocks uh, the TS grinder. So, um, you know, that you just have to be you have to be cognizant that, again, you're going to be in the support nightmare and the more you can drive to a least common denominator solution, I think the the better off you'll you'll be uh, for for many for many respects. I mean, not just security, but from uh, you know, usability. Implement two factor authentication is number four. Uh, we have another story coming up in a minute, uh, a little bit more about that. But I think hopefully it's pretty self explanatory. Uh, you know, one of the one of the issues you open yourself up to when you allow home computers is, you know, they're, they're probably a, um, you know, a zoo of, of, of malware and, and um, password grabbers and or key loggers and whatnot. The good news is it's probably so compromised that the various password grabbers are interfering with each other and, and none of them work. Well that, and I assume there's like a, th- you know, the, the thundering herd problem, in computer science where, you know, suddenly there's a hundred million computers all, sh- you know, shoving uh, uh, key logs up to command and control servers that are suddenly dying. And maybe that's, maybe that's the, well, the plan. Yeah. When you say you make it sound sexy. Uh, well, that's right. Uh, number five, use a virtual private network. Um, you know, they, they, Obviously, that's I think pretty self-explanatory. There, the, the detail here is to make sure that your VPN is actually up to date. I think most most organizations who have a heritage of allowing remote work will will use a VPN. So it's not really a novel idea. But their point here is that you should make sure that your uh, your VPN system is up to date, both on the you know on the concentrator side and on on the endpoint side. There's been quite a few uh, VPN vulnerabilities as of late. Although, you know, it's interesting, those things are, are, you know, this is not an issue that arises as a result of the, you know, people working from home. You, you know, you, you, this would have been an issue whether or not you had people working, so, you know, suddenly working from home. Uh, number six, assess the impact of firewalls, conditional access policies, and other logging. Uh, so again, they point out the problem of uh, Comcast blocking uh, in different services that you may want to use. Um, yeah, you know, which, if, you know, as an example, port four four three to RD Gateway. Um, you know, you 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 really have to. And, and by the way, I've seen this um, in a different context, right? Where you have, uh, you know, let's say. A, a much larger than normal uh, volume of people coming into your uh, remote accessing into your organization. Now, suddenly um, that creates all, all sorts of problems. I mean, from, from bandwidth issues to uh, capacity issues on the VPN uh, concentrator to suddenly you've got people needing to access uh, you know, parts of your network that were just, t- you know, typically kind of like the the story about Apple, right? You know, where where people weren't able to do their job because of the way security was implemented. You know, now, uh, you know, conceivably you could be, you could end up being in a, a, you know, a crisis situation. And that's, by the way, where a lot of security mistakes are, are made, where you're trying to recover from some, you know, some angry executive who can't get to their their you know corporate github server or whatever well and it gets interesting too when you spin up a vpn how those are configured is there split tunneling does all traffic need to come back to corporate yeah you know yeah. uh on split sort of tunneling yeah split tunneling by the way is a, that's one thing i was a little disappointed that they didn't mention that that's a that is a my view an important control especially if you have a, a you know at all a mature um security program where you're monitoring traffic you know once once you start allowing split tunneling you've got a huge blind spot into your network and a, you know, a nice big pivot point the downside is holy god the bandwidth so you got it you got to weigh the the pros and cons there 
Uh, number seven is educating employees on COVID-19 scams. That should be pretty, uh, pretty obvious. Although, I- interestingly, I think they're really pointing out not necessarily from a consumer point of view, but maybe as a, um, you know, from a, from a company perspective. And they, they point out that you should make sure that people understand where to go to get you know, the official communication related to your, you know, for your organization rather than, you know, just emailing people uh, kind of ad hoc uh, so that they can easily detect, you know, or tell what, what's legitimate versus not. It seems like a good idea to me. And number eight, update acceptable use policies for employees because your acceptable use policy probably already says they can't use personal workstations if you're a bigger company and now you're telling them they have to. So that's not a... Not not necessarily a good place to be, and they they point out that you know if you if if this is kind of new ground for you, you may have to talk to your uh, attorneys and and tax advisors because you may have to compensate people for uh, for using their own equipment, which is not a security issue, but um, could cost you money. And then uh, and then the last point is you know planning for the future, basically taking what you've the lessons you've learned and and um, turning that into uh, uh, plans for improvements once everything gets back to normal, hopefully. I would just say try really hard not to let them use their own asset. That's just a kettle of badness. Yeah, I um, uh, yeah, I like I said, it made me breathe into a bag. I, I I was not a not a fan of it, but I understand. You know, when as you pointed out, right? If if it's that, or you close your doors because you can't do work, then you know you. You have to make tough decisions. So that's indeed what business being a business is all about. All right. And the final story for today comes from ZDNet. And the title is Microsoft 99% of compromised accounts did not use multi-factor authentication. This is a summary of a presentation that was given at RSA uh, several weeks ago, where, by the way, a couple of people in the InfoSec community were, were uh, apparently infected with uh, COVID. So interesting times we live in. Uh, but it's a f- kind of a very interesting, although somewhat not surprising, set of stats here. As the headline says, that Microsoft's claim here is that ninety nine percent, ninety nine point nine percent of compromised accounts didn't use multi factor. Does make you wonder what happened with that point one percent where my multi factor was in place. We don't, we don't talk about that incident. <laughs> Clearly, something happened there. Uh, now, there are some more interesting uh, stats a little bit deeper into the article. Microsoft said, uh, this is a quote, Microsoft said on average about 0.5% of all accounts get compromised each month. A number in January 2020 was about 1.2 million. What What's the, the population we're talking about here? They're... I assume it is their a, online services. Yeah, I, I'm I'm going to go out on a limb and say they're talking about O3, you know, Office 365 online uh, users and Azure type things. Yeah, yeah. I, I, okay. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's what they're what they're counting. Okay. Here. Uh, then they then they further go on to say that um, a a good number. And I'm trying to find the exact number. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Um, the vast majority of password replay attacks on Microsoft's infrastructure were carried out using uh, older legacy authentication protocols like SMTP, IMAP, POP, and others. And they, they're going to make a recommendation that you should not uh, use those. And and I think the reason is that those protocols are, n- are, are not designed to... Um, to detect fraud in the way that, uh, fraudulent logins in the way that some of their well, other uh, they're also not are. interactive, so it's very difficult to do a multi-factor authentication on them. Well, good, yeah, that's a very good point, right? Yep. So, yeah, you can use other protocols and other APIs, but uh, those are fairly common that most people are used to using. And you know. You may need to to offer them some other solutions. It's not as simple as just saying, "Hey, here's your Entrust token, your RSA token, or your whatever token," and you know, 
use it for your login. Yeah, indeed. Um, some other interesting uh, data points. Uh, they said that uh, the primary source of uh, hack <laughs> some some interesting wording choice here. The primary source of most hacks of Microsoft accounts was password spraying. Uh, they didn't give the they didn't give the uh, um, the, you know, the the exact uh, stat there. But uh, then they said the second uh, the second most common source was password replays. And the way they distinguish those, it, it's interesting. I'm not I've not seen. Until this article, I've not seen a you know a, a really firm uh, delineation between passwords uh, spraying and password replays. But I thought this is a you know pretty good uh, way to characterize them. Password spraying in their vernacular is where you, you know, where the attacker picks one you know let's say commonly used password as in their example here at Spring Twenty Twenty exclamation point. And they try that password across many, you know, many thousands of different uh, usernames, usually email addresses. And then password replay attacks are where uh, they're picking, or the attackers are picking out password and uh, in email address or, or login ID pairs from, you know, known data breaches, and then and then trying those. Uh, so it's not terribly surprising that th these are so effective and it's also not surprising if these are the main way that accounts are getting compromised that two factor is such an important uh, control yeah it, you know i agree with him ultimately it stops a lot of the simple password guessing and simple password reuse type attacks that are very effective uh, i know that some people don't like to use multi-factor for the friction it causes or the confusion or the level of complexity, but it's a very effective control and we should be using it, especially in anything internet facing. Yeah. And it's, it's not exactly a, um, you know, an immature control. Like you, 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 I mean, you encounter it every, everywhere. Right. And, and I, I mean, I think the first time you and I implemented it, it was back in the late nineties. Yeah, when you know back, I think when RSA was right. one of the only real solutions, and they've proliferated now, and everybody supports it. And I mean, yeah, the, and there's there's tons and tons of different different solutions. And you know, even so much as hey, just send a, another login code via SMS to a phone. Which yes, there's weaknesses. Yes, people can sim jack and get that, but that again, it raises the bar and makes it harder for the bad guys. And you've got to decide what your own, you know, threat world is and whether or not you're you're someone who's going to be targeted, whether or not your accounts are worth going that to that level. If you're, you know, I don't know who you are. I don't know what your threat is, I, but no, no, it, it makes it, it harder. If there's anything I've learned about the security community, it's that if it's not perfect, then you may as well just turn off authentication altogether. Like if you're going to go okay. to SMS, you may as well just get rid of usernames and passwords too. Just let everybody in because, you know, it's... You're right. Uh, Information just wants to be free. Just, yeah. yeah it's it, it's ridiculous. We, we should... Um, we, you yeah. know, if we gave away all the information, there would be no more hacking because there'd be no more reason to. You, you, I mean, you can't argue with that kind of logic, right? You just, you just can't. I, I'm not trying to say that there's not a valid point for bringing that up, but... I like to call people who go to the extreme edge case extremists and we've got to find that balance that makes sense for our situation. And this article I think is often referencing a lot of personal accounts or home accounts. Yes. And I mean, yeah, look, I could make an argument that if somebody wanted to get into your bank accounts and steal your money, the first thing they're going to go after is your email account because most likely you've got recovery there. So Maybe SMS, maybe it's worth um, having something a little stronger. But again, it's not that complicated. There's all sorts of authentication apps out there that, that you can put on your smartphone that make this really easy. So yeah, I, I don't know. I'm just rambling at this point, but I can't I can't disagree with anything you're saying here. No, I, I agree. And we we have seen, by the way, there's been a lately there's been a, a bunch of high profile sim jacking attacks, but they, they tend to be Going after much more significant types of of um, 
of, of bait, I guess, right? And, you know, for example, one of the the common attacks uh, that's used for is stealing uh, Bitcoin private keys, <laughs> you know, right? rather than uh, you know, trying to necessarily get into your your uh, your company. But but over time, you know that 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 dynamic will probably change, right? And so maybe in five years, this is a whole different discussion, and you know everybody and their dog is getting compromised through sim jacking attacks, and and then the calculus changes. Certainly. Yeah, and it's a constant moving target. We know that. But there are still some common basics that apply. And we know at this point static engine and passwords are bad. Yeah, I mean, really bad. Uh, so so they, I, I, I did find that stat I was looking for earlier. Uh, they said uh, more precisely 99% of password spraying attacks and 97% of password replay attacks were carried out via the le- legacy authentication protocols. And again, as you pointed out, that's because they're, you know, I think – it's pretty well known that they're not going to they're not going to present a second factor challenge, and you know it's it's an inefficient protocol to run these attacks against. Um, Indeed, so, yeah, interesting interesting times. I will anecdotally say, by the way, and and this is an advertisement for my uh, um, my, my Mastodon server again, but I, I because of spam, I, I had to turn on. Uh, moderation uh, uh, account moderation so when somebody signs up they actually have to you know sends me an email and i have to approve them and and it's been fascinating over the past several weeks it's very it's become very clear to me that there are a massive number of email accounts that are being compromised and used for such trivial purposes as trying to create bogus accounts on some you know, crazy little Mastodon server to, you know, to post spam on, you know, and I mean, I, I'm talking like industrial scale. Um, wow. And, and it's Gmail, Proton Mail, Microsoft, you know, the various Microsoft domains, uh, Comcast, it is every major domain you can think of. I'm seeing it. So this is really turning into a, um, you know, a, a very, uh, a very large scale, operation and you know, that, that people are uh, you've found a very way very good way to operationalize so, so do you think that that's really just like uh, an abstracted industrialization of taking over accounts for and then farming it out for whoever wants to use them yeah i th- I, I think so yeah yep yeah and I, I suspect what's happening i mean I, again i don't have any deep insight into what's really going on but i strongly suspect that different adversaries are getting their hands on on the you know the different data breach you know data dumps of uh, of credentials and they're just you know trying them and it, and it makes me wonder by the way if many of these accounts are abandoned right like you know they were set up and they're just no longer used because sure i mean we, if you if you think about it right they're logging in and and um you know, they're creating other accounts using these emails. So they're getting the emails, these email accounts are getting incoming emails. And if somebody was actively using them, they'd either know they were locked out or they would see all sorts of, you know, account registrations that are actually being acknowledged. And, and I would assume somebody would say, ah, what, what the heck is going well, on here? I mean, the sad truth is there's a non-trivial number of people who have died since all these services uh, came into being. Yeah, that's a, that's also a fascinating point. Um, right. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, uh, I, uh, I've seen it myself and it's, it's kind of crazy, but not a lot of these services have some sort of, you know, one year idle timeout or anything like that where they right. would automatically shut down. So I don't, I don't know. And I, I mean, that's a whole other topic of how we're going to deal with these dormant accounts from users who have died. I don't think the industry even has a clue yet. You know, there's a few companies kind of nibbling at that problem, but in general, it's sort of this big, weird, uh, I don't know. We'll figure it out next year. <laughs> indeed. Indeed. So, uh, so that, yeah, that's the, that's the story Then you know, that I would say the, the net takeaway from this is number one, multi-factor authentication for things uh, that you authenticate over the internet is extremely important. And number two is the use of these legacy protocols 
uh, you know, is, is doubly problematic. Uh, but, you know, even if you, if you get rid of those, you're still going to have an issue if you don't have, have multi-factor authentication. So, um, you know, it's obvious, right? Um, you know, but it's, it is painful for some organizations and it's not often, it's not free. Uh, so, so yeah. Yeah. Anything else, anything else you wanted to say about it? So how's your uh, multi-llama authentication service going? Is that going to launch anytime soon? Well, we're in uh, we're actually in stealth mode right now. So I was hoping not to keep it under wraps for a little bit longer. Um, you know, because we're we're still going for the next round of uh, funding. But mm, I see, I see. Yeah. So you'll just edit this segment out. Cur- cur- yeah, exactly. I have yeah. to. Right. Right. Uh, just you know, pro tip: llamas make a lot of noise. They're not that quiet. Your neighbors probably know. Ooh, damn it. That's why. But what... you know, hey, good good luck. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Well, that is the the show for today. Uh, thank you for listening, and uh, again, thank you to all our Patreon donors who are uh, who are continuing to hang with us even in these uh, these difficult times. And and I know that there have been several people who have had to cancel and and said that they're you know they're out of work, and I, I certainly understand that. But um, you know, I really appreciate those of you who are who are still there. And and um, absolutely, me too. Thank you very and, much. You know, it is it is a tough time out there. So, you know, take care of yourself, guys. Have have patience. Be calm. Yep. We'll get through this. Be good to each other. Be good to yourself. And we'll talk again uh, real soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.